Hello and welcome to your next lesson on Anglo-Saxon and Norman England with me, your host, Mr. Johnston. Now, uh, last time we were looking at how the Anglo-Saxons arranged themselves, their hierarchy, king at the top and the peasants at the bottom. And we were also looking at the powers of the monarchy and whether or not Edward was indeed a weak king. Now, today, we are going to be looking at the Anglo-Saxon economy, which basically means how did, the, uh, how did the country make its money in the 11th century? So, um, as I talk to you, can we please make sure that you are writing today's title, underline it, just like I have, and you have a starter task to get on with. So, we have a list of uh, natural resources and what they are used for, and you have to match them up. Um, this will, of course, be useful to you, because later on in the lesson, we will be having a go at a GCSE question, where you may need to know. Once you've written down today's title, have a go with that, okay? Now, today we are going to firstly describe the key features of towns and villages, and then we're going to explain why the economy was so healthy. So basically, England in the 11th century was doing pretty well financially. And we are going to be looking at that by explaining um, who England traded with and who Eng what kind of things England imported at this time. Okay? So make sure you have written down today's title and underlined it and have had a little go at that starter task. Okay? So let's have a little look. So salt, um, you need to match that up. So let's have a little look. Um, it is, of course, used for preserving food. Okay, so they would use, they didn't have freezers back then. So salt was used to preserve food, to keep it, if you cover it in salt, keeps it, um, you can store it for a long time. Um, things like meat and fish stops it going sour. Uh, churches and monasteries, of course, these buildings were full of jewels and other valuables. This made them targets for raiders. Specifically, those Vikings, they kept raiding every year because those churches and monasteries uh, were filled full of treasures, okay? Uh, fish, of course, in plentiful supply in the seas around England, where you a valuable food source. In fact, uh, fish was one of the main reasons why the Saxons migrated to England in the first place, because England had lots of uh, raw natural resources, fish being one of them. Uh, coins we have made from a range of metals in places called mints. So if you read something about mint, not talking about food, it's talking about a place where coins are made. Okay? Um, it, it was illegal in Anglo-Saxon England to mint a coin uh, unless you were the monarch. Okay. Uh, wheat, what, how, what are we going to link that one up to? Wheat, well, we have... Oh, it's not there. That's very strange. Well, we could just maybe draw a little line next to that and explain that wheat was made for using, it uh, was used for making bread. Okay. Uh, wool, um, if we got anything, are some of these missing? I hope they're not missing. Ah, there it is there. Wool was needed to make cloth. The cloth industry was the most important in England. And wool, of course, was often exported all across Europe. Okay. Uh, we have lead there. It says, often used to make bronze. Bronze was a valuable metal for making tools and jewellery, sometimes lead. Okay. And, oh no, sorry, that's absolute nonsense. Lead, of course, is um, they would mine it in a number of places. Okay. Um, so, these are some of the natural resources that England had at that time and what they were used for. Okay. So, without further ado, let us begin. So, if you had to go back to the 11th century, England was a little bit different to what it was today. Um, roughly, there were about 2 million people living in England at this time, and unlike today, most of them lived in villages. And what you can see right here is an artist's rendition of a village. Now, villages were often made up of small houses, and um, as you can see in this drawing, they were small um, buildings with a thatched roof, um, usually a mud or clay walls, um, single rooms 
inside, just one room inside, uh, with a little hole at the top um, for the smoke to escape when you're cooking. And villages, uh, were where peasants would live. Churls would live there as well. Remembering from last lesson, churls, of course, being free men who could move from farm to farm. Now, as you, again, as you can see in this artist's impression, they were often built, neat settlements were always built near rivers. Why? Because you need access to fresh water and you may also need access to fish, okay? Uh, and if you're grazing animals, they will need access to drinking water as well. So villages were often located near rivers. Um, they would be very close to farmlands because Anglo-Saxon England was predominantly uh, agricultural. You'd have lots and lots and lots of sheep around you. Um, so local villages would be involved in um, rearing sheep and make using their resources like wool, meat, and milk. Okay, you would often have other farm animals as well. Um, so these villages, they were often connected to other villages via um, roads. They wouldn't be roads like today. They wouldn't be armarked or anything like that. They would just be either old Roman roads you know, when the Romans occupied Britain, or they could just be kind of dirt tracks um, for transporting materials. Now, uh, there is, of course, many replicas of Anglo-Saxon towns throughout Britain that you can go and visit, uh, but this is roughly what they would have looked like, looked like, okay? Just a couple of small houses, 12 to 15 of them, um, mostly agricultural, um, and yeah, they're pretty self-explanatory villages. Towns are a little bit different. So towns were, um, there was no cities in Anglo-Saxon England. There were only, t um, the nearest thing you had was a town. Um, they were surrounded by a wall, um, sometimes stone, sometimes wood, mostly stone. Um, that way the town would be protected against raiders, mostly Vikings. Towns were where about 10% of England lived in towns. Um, and they were usually on the location of where the Romans uh, originally had a settlement. So, for example, um, Carlisle um, is, was Lugivalium, which was a Roman uh, settlement near Hadrian's Wall. So, the Saxons often built their towns uh, on the site of where the Romans used to have. So, towns were often connected via old Roman roads, um, because if it ain't broke, why fix it? And if there's decent roads and decent settlements, you may as well build there as well. And the Romans tended to build settlements uh, in sensible places, high ground, near rivers, near strategic places. Uh, now, towns had most of the wealth of England. So towns are where all the trading took place. Uh, towns are where you would find um, most people, uh, you know, the largest population. So there were no cities back then, but some of the cities that we know today were towns back then. So London, for example, had about 10,000 people, and then you had York, Southampton, uh, Winchester. There, there was no capital of England, uh, but the closest thing that they had was Winchester, because that's where the royal treasury was. So that's where all of the king's documents were kept. And that's where all of the, the mint, all the coins were minted in Winchester. Now, towns were really, really important because that is where the trade would take place. So there would be weekly markets there, and if you had any produce, you wanted to sell or trade you would take it to a town um, to do that that way towns um, could tax that but we'll speak about that in a minute okay so a uh, big difference between towns and cities now you need to know the difference between these so you are going to draw a venn diagram in your book or even better um, on a blank diagram of a venn diagram uh, to make it as neat as possible and you have a series of facts, uh, and you need to decide whether they, whether they are about towns, whether they're about villages, or whether they are about both. Okay? And this shouldn't take you too long. It's a pretty straightforward task. So I'll give you, oh, I don't know, I'll give you about 10 minutes, maybe even less than that to do that. Okay? Off we go. Okay, so you should be looking at a pretty detailed uh, Venn diagram, so let's very quickly go through it. So in total, 10% of England lived in a town. Uh, marketplace, that would be in a town as well. So um, we're going to talk about markets in a moment. Mint would always be in a town. You could even put in brackets Winchester with a population of 
5,000. 12 to 15 houses, that would probably be a village. Towns would be a little bit bigger than that. Defensive wall, usually stone, is definitely a town. So, for example, Carlisle still has uh, the city walls. York has as well. Um, these are walls that were originally built to protect the city, uh, protect the town, sorry, against attacks. Uh, an earl, well, an earl uh, would actually live in uh, most of the time in a village. You wouldn't really find them in towns. Sometimes in towns, but uh, we're going to put him in a village. Near a river, if possible, both. Both of them would have to near a river because they need fresh water. Um, they might need to fish in it. So both of them would be near a river, if possible. Mostly agricultural, uh, farming, eh, both probably. Um, I'll forgive you if you wrote just village, but both of them would be mostly agricultural because England as a whole was an agricultural um, country back then. Higher status and more money. That is definitely a town uh, because towns are where all the trade would take place. So that's where all the dinero is going to be. London and York, examples of towns, 5,000 to 10,000 people, towns, 90% of England lived here. That's a village. Plough was the most valuable item. Oh, that's a curved wall. Well, a plough is used for farming land. So I imagine that that is probably going to be in a village because in towns um, you'd have a lot of valuable items. That's where things were traded. So plough probably in a village. Although you would find you would probably find ploughs in towns as well. Regularly checked by the Earl. Well, both of them. Um, the Earl of an area is going to travel round his earldom and often visit towns and villages. So both. The church was one of the most important buildings. That, of, co of course, is in a town. Okay. And we're going to be doing a lesson on the church a little bit later on in the unit. Uh, a house was one large room. Both, I suppose, because both towns and villages had houses in them. Animals would be brought inside when the weather was bad. Well, that's both as well, because you're going to find animals in both towns and villages and an earl's personal estate that would probably be in a village um because um a lot of space don't you a lot of tapestries and things like that so an earl is going to be in a village okay right so if we're finished with that one it is time to progress to our the differences uh, in how the anglo-saxons made money okay so if you were living in a village in the 11th century, then chances are you would have an agricultural economy, which meant that you made your money from farming. Okay, that could be from crops, it could be from raising animals, it could be from making things from those materials, like clothing, for example. Um, some peasants in villages would have craft skills, so they might be a blacksmith, or they could be a carpenter, or a joiner, or something like that. They might be a weaver, so they weave cloth together. Um, they, but that was always in addition to being a farmer. So all peasants were predominantly farmers. Um, in the village, you a little bit different to today. So today we have a currency, we have pounds, and if we need food, we go to the supermarket, and if we want money, we have to work for it, and then we use that money to buy food and stuff like that. A little bit different in the 11th century, so um, a lot of peasants actually practiced what we call a uh, sustenance living, which means um, you just, you live off what you make. So you grow your own food, you make your own clothes, you hunt your own animals, um, you build your own house, and that's it. Okay, you don't make any wages because you're effectively growing your own things to live, and uh, you don't trade with anyone else, um, that is sustenance living, okay? Some peasants, however, would actually make a little bit more. So they would grow enough food for themselves, but also a little bit more. Or they would make enough uh, things for themselves, plus a little bit more. And then they could take that to a town to trade with. That's called exchange living. There's a big difference between sustenance living, which means being self-sufficient, um, living off the fat of the land, as John Steinbeck wrote about in Of Mice and Men. Um, and exchange living, which means you go somewhere and you trade something for something else, okay? Where would you go to trade? You would go here, to a town. So I kind of mentioned this earlier. Towns were mostly exchange economies. So towns are where you would go. You'd go to the market, and if you wanted something, you would buy it. But you would not buy it with money, although some peasants, some 
people in England would be using silver pennies, and we'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But most people traded, which means you would take um, something that you had made or grown and you would exchange it for the item that you require, okay? Now, towns were streaming with lots and lots of different goods that you could buy because um, England in the 11th century was trading with other countries. So, for example, if you went to a market in the, in, in the 11th century, you could buy, for example, wine from France. Um, so England was importing wine from France. Pepper from as far away as Asia or the East Indies. Uh, cloth, fine cloth, like silk, all the way uh, from the uh, all the way from Spain or the Middle East, as well as precious gems um, from again from Asia or the Middle East. Um, England, uh, you know, you could buy silver products uh, imported from Germany. As well as lots of other things like precious metals and pottery. So England was importing lots of exotic goods at this time. Um, you could trade these things. You could trade these things for whatever you had brought with you. Now I have here, um, although I think there's a little bit of a delay in this video, but it will appear eventually. Um, I said to you earlier that, you know, they didn't, very few people actually spent money in the 11th century. You would have to trade for something that you had. So, for example, um, 15 chickens, uh, that is about the value of one silver coin. Because a silver coin had roughly about one and a half grams of silver in it. So 15 chickens was the equivalent of one coin. And as you can see, some things got really, really expensive. So every year I have students saying to me, oh, if I was alive back then, I would have a sword and a shield and all this stuff. Well, if you look at the price of them, I highly doubt that. Um, sword, for example, was 1,240 silver coins, which is thousands in today's money. Um, so you would take the value of that product in whatever you had, whether it be... Um, Maybe an animal, maybe a pig or a cow or some chickens. It might even be um, something you've grown, like um, crops that you could trade for whatever you need. Um, and that is how towns worked, okay? So that's called an exchange economy. Now, that is not to say that England did not have a currency. It did. Anglo-Saxon England had um, these. Again, there might be a little bit of a delay on this, but it will appear. Uh, Anglo-Saxon England had silver pennies. There were roughly about 9 million of them in circulation by 1066. But most people, most ordinary peasants and churls in England, they might come ac across these sometimes, but they would very rarely spend them. They would be, most people would buy and trade things, well, they would trade things, they wouldn't use pennies. But that being said, there were pennies around um, that were minted in the Royal Mint in Winchester. As I say, one penny was one and a half grams of silver. And as you can see, um, it would always be stamped with the monarch's um, official seal or his image. So it might be difficult to work this out, but uh, that's Edward, the King of England in the middle. He's holding in his right hand um, the scepter, um, which is, it represents the, the king's role as a judge, as a fair judge, being fair and being merciful. Uh, he's also holding in his left hand the orb, which is a round orb um, that has a crucifix on the top of it. That represents um, God or Christ's dominion over the world, which basically means the monarch is God's representative on earth. So there would be some of these pennies in circulation, you know, a, a lot of them, but um, I say, as I say, most peasants would trade um, in towns for whatever they want, okay? Now, the very last thing I would like to talk about before we do our task today is the different types of tax that you would have to pay if you were a peasant. Because peasants, God love them guys, poor peasants, they would have to pay a lot of different taxes depending on where they lived in England. So the first thing they would all, everyone would have to pay it would be a tithe. T-I-T-H-E, a tithe. A tithe actually comes from the old English word which means ten because a tithe is 10% of your monthly earnings. Um, so that could be in the value, that could be in the form of pennies or probably the form of produce, things that you've grown, things that you've made. And you had to give that to the church. Okay? Uh, you also had a land tax. So you did 
peasants didn't own their land, they rented it from their thane, so they would have to pay their thane for the right to work on that land. Um, again, usually in the form of produce, um, but uh, and also they would have to work for their thane for a certain amount of days. So that's your land tax. Uh, you also have a market tax. So if you're a peasant and you want to go to market to trade, you know, to, to trade or to trade what you have, you have to pay a fee either um, in coin or in produce. So you'd have to give um, the local uh, sheriff of the town um, a set amount um, in order to kind of open a stall or you would have to pay a percentage of your profits at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, the last one, again, it depends where you lived in England, people in the Dane law, uh, which you should remember from um, the very first lesson, of course, that large area in the north of England. And uh, people in the Dane law didn't pay it, but the rest of England had to pay something called a geld tax, often known as a hair geld or a Dane geld. The word geld, of course, just means payment. Um, so the Dane geld or the geld tax was money that you, or produce that you had to pay every month in order to allow your earl to raise money to hire mercenaries to fight against the Vikings if they arrived. So poor peasants, as you can see, not very happy because they're being bled dry. They have so many different taxes to pay. Okay. So just to recap, before we get on with our task, how did England make its money? Well, it traded. Um, there was lots of trade going on in England. And mostly in the towns where you could take things to market and trade or whatever you need. And what was England exporting uh, to the rest of the world? Well, it was exporting its wool. It was exporting pottery. It was exporting things like cheese and iron, uh, as well as even some slaves. England was even exporting slaves to places like um, to Ireland from Bristol. Um, and what was England importing? Well, it was importing a lot of uh, precious metals like silver from Germany, uh, glassware, wine from France, spices and silk from the Far East. So there was a lot of exports and imports going on in England. And if that was traded in towns, it could all be taxed uh, and all that tax, all that money uh, would be reinvested back into the country. Um, where would that money go? Well, it would be spent on rebuilding roads, making sure that towns had proper walls around them, making sure that house carls could be trained properly to fight in the fjord or the army. Um, and this is how England made its money, okay? So, our task for today, and if you need to rewind this video to rewatch bits or re-listen to bits, you are more than welcome. But there is a very, very handy little um, set of notes that are attached to this video that you can use for this task, okay? So, number one, we are in our books, we're going to explain the difference between a sustenance economy and an exchange economy, okay? So the differences between being self-sufficient and trading. Then, on your black map of England, which again is attached to this lesson, you are going to annotate the following. The flow of exports. So all that means is, what was England exporting to the world? So you can annotate it, and draw in what the country was exporting, and then the same with flow of imports, which means what was England importing? What kind of things were England bringing in from other countries to sell? Um, and you can make it as colourful and as beautiful as you want. You may also want to add in the main export towns, so places like Bristol and London and places like this, okay? Then you are going to collect, again, these attachments are all uh, attached to the lesson. You are going to, around the photograph or the picture of the peasant family, annotate the different types of taxes that they had to pay and what the point in each of them was. So what was the purpose of the Dane Geld? What was the purpose of the tithe? Etc. Etc. Okay? Now, when you finish that, um, what you're going to do is you're going to move on and you're going to try and use everything you've learned today as well as the other lessons, and you're going to apply it to a GCSE question, okay? But I'll pause right now, I'll give you 15 minutes to do this task, and then we'll touch back in, and we'll go through the exam question, okay? Go. Right, so you've had a good 15 minutes, um, of course, hopefully you've paused it, if not, 
I've just started talking again. Um, if I am talking and you haven't finished, please pause me and go on with the work. Rewind the video if you have to. So just before we leave for today, I would like to apply all this information we've learned to an exam question. Now, if you look to the right hand side of this slide, you'll see three exam questions. They're basically all the same question. I've just worded them in a slightly different way depending on target grades, okay? So what we're looking at is why Anglo-Saxon England was considered such an advanced economy, okay? Or such a wealthy country, or why were the Saxon kings so rich? Now, I for you guys, at home, I have actually personalized um, each um, kind of target grade here to show you exactly how we are going to write it. So I'm going to very quickly walk you through each. And again, feel free to skip to the uh, target grade that applies to you. Okay. So we'll begin with um, targets of a six, a seven, and an eight, and a nine as well, of course. So the really the top end of GCSE. So if a question asks you to explain why something happened or why something can be considered something, it will give you two bullet points. And you'll notice here that it says, you may use the following, global trading, taxation. So for this question, what you have to do is write three paragraphs, okay? You are given two pages of script in the exam. So they're expecting you to write a good amount. So you wanna write three paragraphs and each paragraph has to be about one specific reason, okay? Now, each paragraph, as you can see to the right-hand side, needs to follow a P-E-E-L, P-E-E-L structure, okay? So we're going to begin by introducing our point. Then you're going to give some evidence, specific evidence. You're then going to explain that. So why is that important? And then link it back to the question, okay? So we'll begin by, I've actually given you your first sentence. One reason why England was considered an advanced economy was because it had a very effective tax system. For example, and then you would write a paragraph about tax, you have examples of the different tax, explain why that tax was so important, so what was that tax used for, and then link it back to your question by saying, well, how did that help the country? Like, what was the effect of that on the country? Now, if you're sitting there and you're getting all, all, all nervous because you don't know what an advanced economy is, well, that's just the exam board way of saying, if you look to the left, an advanced country is a country that trades with other countries, exports a lot of things as a currency, has a very clear and structured system of tax, generates a lot of wealth from that tax. You could also write about a country that can defend itself, um, a country that has a decent uh, legal justice system, um, a, a, system, a country that is well ruled and well governed. You can talk about the hierarchy from the very first lesson or the uh, the the different types of courts in England and how why what happened to people who committed crimes. Okay, so we're trying to write three paragraphs explaining why England was considered quite a well-run, advanced country. So if something's advanced, it just means it's well-run. It's 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 going. It's doing the thing that it should be doing. Okay, um, and remember, each paragraph should be a different reason. So if I was you, I would write one paragraph on trading one paragraph on tax, and my third paragraph, you can choose what you want to do. Me personally, I'd probably do um, how land was divided up into earldoms and smaller areas of land for thanes, and how each area was governed by one specific person, and that was important because it allowed the monarch to govern the country and, you know, ensure that all the monarch's rules and laws were, in, were implemented, and without this land division, the monarch would really struggle to run the country, so something like that make it as detailed as possible and uh, i'm sure your teacher would love to read your answer when you're finished okay and this should take you about 15 minutes go cool. okay for those of you who are targets fours and fives you are explaining why england was considered such a wealthy country so what was making england wealthy back then you may use the following raw materials and tax so you want to write two paragraphs and each paragraph should be on a different reason, okay? Each paragraph has to follow a P-E-E-L structure. So you're going to introduce your point. You're going to provide some evidence. You're going to explain each point by explaining for what impact did that have? How did it make England rich? Make sure you link it back to the question, okay? Um, I've actually given you a sentence to start off your answer. 
one reason why England was so was considered a wealthy country was because it had a lot of raw materials to trade, for example, and then discuss all the things that England had that it could export to the world and how all of that was traded for expensive exotic materials which were then brought back, sold in its markets, and that money of course was then reinvested back into England to pay for things like roads and castles, not castles, but um, roads and walls around cities and the army and things like that, okay? And then you're going to write a paragraph on um, tax, or you could even write, if you don't even want to use these, you could write about, <laughs> um, well, actually, yeah, just stick to raw materials and tax and explain how that made England so advanced and um, so wealthy in the 11th century, okay? And this should take you about 15 minutes. Off you go. And finally, targets of twos and threes. So you are going to explain why Anglo-Saxon kings were so rich. What made them so filthy, stinking rich? So we've got tax from peasants, tax on trading, and you're going to write one or even two paragraphs. But, you know, if you're going for a two or a three, even one good paragraph would be enough. Uh, try to not be too descriptive. So it has to actually answer the question, why were their kings so rich? So try to follow that structure. You introduce your point, give some evidence, and then link it back to the question. So one reason why Anglo-Saxon kings were so rich was because they gained huge profit from tax. For example, and then write a paragraph on that. Write a as much detail as you can write about how, where all this tax came from, and who paid who, and how it all came back to the monarch, and how it made the monarch or the king very very rich so one paragraph even maybe even two but again you can write one really good paragraph that would be fantastic for this question okay so i want you to spend a good 10 minutes on it maybe even 15 and try to write something that your teacher would be proud of following a basic p e e l format okay off we go Okay, and that pretty oh oh dear me, and that pretty much ends our lesson on the Anglo-Saxon economy. Okay, so you should have followed this lesson, read the um the page of notes that I attached to the attached to the lesson, had a go at the tasks. Everything should be neatly presented. If you've got any handouts, make sure everything's glued into that book. Okay, and you may have um. Any questions, if you have, please ask your history teacher. If your history teacher is me, by all means, drop me an email. Um, or you can rewatch the video um, and do a bit of reading, folks. Go online, do a bit of reading. Um, again, these lessons are just the bare bones of the course. Uh, there is so much more to Anglo-Saxon history that you can find out online. Now, uh, stay tuned for next lesson which is going to be on, well, what is it going to be on? I hear you asking. Well, we're going to have a quick look at the church and how Anglo-Saxon England defended itself. So the different armies, the army that it had. And then we are working our way towards, drum roll please, the succession crisis of 1066. Okay, so tune in next lesson for some more GCSE history.